we'll go ahead and get started. So my name is Sam Bogan. I am a PhD student at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, I am also a co-organizer along with Catherine Silliman of Auburn University of the Marine Omics Working Group. We are a network of mostly early career researchers and um, faculty advisors who with support from the Research Coordinated Network for Evolution in Changing Seas are working to provide resources for robust and reproducible genomic research in non-model systems. Um, some of these resources include our panel series. Today's RNA-seq panel is the last of a series of four panels on different genomic applications. Um, thank you everyone for coming and joining us today. Um, whether it be the early morning or the late evening for you, we really appreciate you being here. Um, that is doubly true for our panelists calling in from Europe, where I believe it is 6 p.m. Um, our five panelists today um, include Martin Holzer from the University of Jena in Germany, Sarah Davies from, the, um, from Boston University, Joanna Kelly from Washington State University, Harold Pimentel from UCLA, and Ana Knessa Segarra from the University of Florida and the Integrative Systems Biology, um, or the uh, Center for Integrative Systems Biology in Spain. So these panels um, and our RNA-seq panel today have sort of had two main goals. The first of which is to provide a space for constructive dialogue on genomic applications in ecology and evolution. And secondly, to gain insight from users and developers um, on our panels for guidelines that we will be publishing to our working group's website, which we hope will serve um, when it's launched in August or September as a living resource that can help um, promote best principles for different genomic tools in areas for which perhaps the literature might have less consensus or coverage um, on how those principles should be applied. We will be asking our panelists a series of prepared questions for the majority of the panel, um, but we will also encourage questions in the chat. Uh, myself and my co-moderator, Hanny Rivera, will be moderating the chat and saving um, questions for an open question period of the panel uh, at the end of today's discussion. Um, and if a certain question is extremely relevant in the moment, we might jump in and um, ask one of our panelists about it as well. So before we begin, I'll hand things over to Hanny. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Hanny Rivera. I'm a postdoc at Boston University, actually in Sarah Davies' lab. Um, so today, I want to uh, allow the panelists to do a brief introduction, um, just quickly introduce themselves, what kind of expertise they have in RNA-seq. And we've written a little bit of an icebreaker question for our panelists to answer, just to kind of delve into uh, the messy world of RNA-seq. So that question is, what was the last RNA-seq study that you conducted, and what were its biggest pitfalls or challenges? So I guess I'll direct this a little bit, and I'll just popcorn over to Martin. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Should work. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here today. I'm Martin. Um, I'm a bioinformatician uh, by training. Actually, I'm not anymore at the University of Jena in Germany. I moved um, mid of last year to the uh, Robert Koch Institute, which is actually the um, public health institute of Germany. And here I'm a deputy of the um, bioinformatics uh, department. And yeah, since then I'm mainly dealing with uh, SARS-CoV-2 actually, because that's uh, at the public health institute in Germany. It's now a major, major task. But uh, in the past, I was working a lot in the field of genomics and transcriptomics, mainly um, assembly, um, de novo assembly of non-model species and also um, differential uh, gene expression analysis. And um, yes, yeah, so I'm really happy to uh, discuss about this topic uh, here today and not all the time about SARS-CoV-2, which is of course important, but yeah. Um, and regarding the icebreaker question, so I think the last major RNA-seq study I was involved was actually the development of a pipeline for differential gene expression analysis um, that we call RNA flow. And it's, I mean, there are a lot of pipelines out there, as you might know, but um, here still I see the challenges and pitfalls. And I think you can relate to that in really getting all the tools running, um, installing uh, all the tools. 
and then also get your pipeline not only running on your own laptop, but also on another machine, a cluster, or even the cloud. And um, I think here we, we developed a nice pipeline for this. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, could we go to Joanna next? Hi, I am Joanna Kelly. I'm an associate professor at Washington State University in Pullman, Washington, which is five and a half hours from Seattle, for those of you that don't know where Pullman is I'm on the Idaho border. Um, so at any given time in my lab, we're really thinking about maybe three or four RNA-seq studies that span from hydrogen sulfide adapted fishes to polar adapted fishes in the ocean to hibernating bears. And I think kind of tailing really nicely from what Martin said is one of our challenges is the second that we think we have a pipeline that we're happy with and works well, uh, tools are updated, there are new tools that become available. And so we're, there is no pipeline, right? Because any time where we think this is the way we're gonna do it for, this, for these set of studies, we're automatically changing to the next newest um, tool and reanalyzing our data. And you know, not surprisingly, those top genes sometimes change. And then we're trying to understand why and what were assumptions that changed in the new version or the new, the new mapper that we're using or something. So I think for us, the continual kind of challenges are making sure that we're using the and understanding the most relevant tools while answering the scientific questions that we're interested in. So balancing being current with the tools, with making sure they're appropriate assumptions for the study that we have. Um, for example, one of the um, exciting RNA-seq studies that we're currently working on is across a bunch of different species. And we have pairs of sulfitic and non-sulfitic environments across a bunch of different species, these are wild caught. And we'd really love to think about this in a phylogenetic framework, but the tools for looking at RNA-seq uh, data in a phylogenetic framework are pretty limited. And so we're balancing, looking at our closely related pairs and having that, at that framework. So that's one of the current challenges that we're, we're working with. Awesome, thank you so much. Well, these challenges are certainly going to lead in nicely with our panel discussions uh, in a bit. Um, can we go over to Harold? Hi there. Uh, so firstly, thanks uh, so much for inviting me. I'm um, hoping to have some fun today. Um, so I'm Harold. Um, I'm assistant professor at UCLA, um, classically trained in computer science and statistics, but uh, um, these days I pretend to be a biologist. Um, so I mostly um, do um, alternative splicing type stuff. Um, this, these days my, my group is very interested in developing tools for um, uh, CRISPR perturbation. So we've been doing a lot of stuff with flow cytometry and, and modeling um, quantitative phenotype screens as well as, um, as RNA-seq type uh, perturbations like perturb-seq and this sort of stuff. So um, related to the, this question, um, last RNA-seq, so we're, it's sort of an ongoing thing right now in my group is, is developing um, sort of the intersection between causal inference and uh, CRISPR perturbations for network inference. So we've been analyzing some um, a bunch of arrayed knockouts of, uh, of CRISPR perturbations in, in um, Treg cells, which is a type of immune cell, um, and the challenge there is that there's basically no methods that incorporate any of this um, this stuff. So first of all, there's no ground truth. Second of all, um, there's no methods to even begin to think about this. Um, there's obviously methods for network inference, but nothing that takes into consideration that you knocked out a specific gene, right? And you, you should be able to use this information. So we've been thinking about this pretty carefully. It turns out to be a very hard problem. Um, we'll see how far we can get. Um, uh, and, uh, and yeah, that, that's, that's what we're thinking about these days. Well, that seems like a really interesting uh, problem. Sorry, I forgot to mute myself while you were talking. I have a little bit of construction going on in the background, so I apologize if that came through. Um, can we go to Anna? Uh, yes, uh, hello. Uh, also, thank you for this in invitation. Um, so my name is Anna Conesto. I am a research professor at the um, Institute for Integrative Systems Biology in Valencia, Spain. 
um, since two months ago. Uh, before that, I was a professor at the University of Florida and I'm still uh, kind of um, uh, related to this university as a, as a courtesy faculty. So uh, my group is interested in, so we are mainly a, a, a group that develops methods for the analysis of transcriptomics data, and these are general uh, methods so that they can be applied to any kind of uh, uh, organism of experimental system. So in this sense, we are very general. Um, uh, I'm interested in transcriptomics, also in uh, in uh, multiomics and the integration of multiomics data, and especially trying to to understand what are the uh, biological insights and regulatory insights that you get for the combination of uh, different types of uh, um, high throughput uh, profiling technologies. Um, also, I'm very interested in uh, in long reads and the application of uh, long reads transcriptomics uh, or the long reads to uh, transcriptome analysis. And then for the challenge of for, for uh, the interesting projects, uh, the uh, one that's um, actually heavily involved now is the uh, longer gasp competition, which is a challenge that we launched um, a few weeks ago on for the comparison of uh, uh, long read sequencing platforms and analysis pipelines for, uh, for transcriptome analysis. Um, so uh, we are, in my group, we are, uh, we, so the consortium launching this, this challenge has uh, generated a lot of uh, data that can be used to evaluate or to, to uh, answer these questions on, on, on long reads for transcriptomics, um, answer these questions in a systematic way. And uh, so my group uh, will be uh, taking care of the evaluation of uh, the uh, transcript models uh, uh, reconstructed of created of uh, predicted from long reads data. Um, so we have done a lot of work in developing tools for this uh, assessment of the quality of the um, long reads transcript models. So this is the SCANTI tool that we will use in this project. But very particularly now, the challenge that we have in front of us is um, to create a good methodology and a good metrics uh, to compare the large number of submissions that we expect to, to receive. And in particularly to assess um, the diversity of the complexity of the transcript models that can be predicted by different type of pipelines for a single loci. Um, this can be really uh, interesting to, to look at because we expect that um, there will be a lot of variability. Our loan reads are generating, uh, are discovering new transcripts um, constantly. We know that quite a number of them are pro probably some kind of artifacts, but some others are bona fide novel transcripts that have not been described before, even in well-characterized organisms. And we also face a lot of uh, uh, diversity at the three prime and five prime ends. So to be able to describe this diversity in a systematic way, and especially to be able to identify those low sides that will be good candidates for a follow-up, uh, uh, validation, experimental validation that we uh, we are trying to do in this project. I think that's that's going to require some kind of uh, uh, pipeline building and, and figuring out how is the best way to describe this uh, putative complexity. So that's what we are trying to accomplish now. Sounds like a challenge. I will go over to Sarah. Hi, everyone. So first, thanks for inviting me. I'm like honored to be amongst such incredible scientists. Um, so I'm an assistant professor at Boston University and our lab's largely interested in, you know, using transcriptomics as a tool to understand how non-model marine systems respond to stressors, mostly climate change. So our, you know, organism of choice usually is corals. Um, although we also dabble in um, some mollusks recently because we live in Boston. So we figured we need a local system. Um, and, and yeah, so we're really interested in transcriptome plasticity in response to different stressors and what genes are responsive and how does that shift across like history stages. Um, and we have, 
so many transcriptomic studies going on in the lab right now that it's kind of crazy to nail down one. But um, you know, we've had a we've had a lot of challenges. So um, one of the challenges we have is that corals are a consortium of organisms that associate with algal symbionts that also have massive genomes um, that contaminate all of your libraries. Um, well, they're not really contamination, right? If you're interested in them. Um, but we have a lot of problems with like that they might modulate the host expression and how we disentangle that. Um, and can we even look at the symbiont reads? The symbiont genome is so huge, it's really challenging to get enough like RNA because the host just swaps the signal. Um, and then one of the other challenges we've we have um, is cryptic species in the host. So the like the, you're collecting on the reef and the animals all look the same. They all have like cute little polyps that you can't identify as different. And then you go and you analyze their transcriptomes and the primary axis of variation is just this random signal. And, uh, and then when you go in and call SNPs or something, then you see that, oh wait, they're actually like totally different species. That, um, so that's like a huge challenge because then it creates issues when you're trying to design experiments to understand how a species responds. And now your experimental design just got like totally screwed because you have a bunch of cryptic species. Um, so that's, those are some of the um, experiments we're working on and challenges we're experiencing. And then the last thing I'll just note is that um, uh, actually Dr. Rivera is uh, in the lab embarking on single cell RNA-seq in corals. And it has been a learning experience to just get the tissue to cooperate. But we have our first set of data and now the challenge is, you know, working on non-model systems is like bamboozling all of these programs that are developed for model systems to like to accept your really crappy reference. Um, so now we're trying to like trick a transcriptome to be a GTF file that so we can like convince this program to give us our cells. Um, so it's been interesting. And that's usually what we do in the non-model world is we just like try to bamboozle programs that are developed for like mice and Drosophila and humans and to make them work on our systems that have really crappy references like Boosco scores that I don't even want to tell you. Having just made that uh, bamboozling uh, DTF file yesterday, I can attest that everything she's saying is true. <laughs> um, all right, well, thank you everyone for those uh, really interesting introductions and for giving us a little bit of insight into some of the challenges and cool projects that you are all working on. Um, so we've divided up the um, panel into a couple of different topics being experimental design, transcriptome assembly and alignment, differential expression and functional analysis. Um, so for each of those, we'll have between 10 and 15 minutes uh, for you all to answer the questions. Um, and I'll ask that um, I'll say the question. And then if you wish to chime in, maybe you can use the raise hands functions and then um, Sam or I will call on, on um, whoever is kind of in line to answer the, the question. Okay, so the first one is about experimental design. Um, uh, so kind of as Sarah alluded, in non-model systems, we have a lot of issues with this, uh, but uh, there certainly are more beyond cryptic species and corals just being uh, very mysterious organisms. Um, so the question is, what are the most problematic confounding effects or sources of error that researchers should be aware of when going into an RNA-seq experiment? And how can these be handled either in the design stage of an experiment or afterwards when you're dealing with such issues during analysis? I saw Joanna's hand go up first. Go ahead, Joanna. Sure, thanks. This is something that I've thought a fair bit about and really um, working with non-model organisms, especially in any kind of field setting, is the aspect that I wanted to, to touch on briefly, which is that there are things that happen in the field that you can't control, right? And some of the organisms that you study, you may only be able to access them on the Tuesday after a full moon when it happens to have flooded, right? Um, I mean, anyone who's worked on a non-model gets this, right? It's like, you, it's so opportunistic and dependent on when you have a permit and when the field crew is available and all of these different things. And so there are lots of things that happen in the field that you cannot control for that may confound. Um, maybe the, you know, one, for example, in our, in one of our study systems, right, we work on hydrogen sulfide adapted fishes and non-adapted. And when we go out into the field, you really cannot sample multiple sites in a single day because of where they are, which means that there may be rain between when you sample one site and the next site, for example. 
Um, and those are the, those are things that you really can never control. You can record them, and I think taking really meticulous field notes so that if you are going back to a site or a population, then you have multiple years of data that you can compare in the future, whatever, just like meticulous field notes is really important for a lot of those things that you can't control. And you may not think that it's important, but what's the temperature? What's the What's the, I mean, I don't record barometer. I'm, I'm being a little bit dramatic there, but you know, what are things that you might not even realize you need to record and try to just take those really meticulous field notes. And some of us who are trained as genome scientists, um, mostly on the computer are not as good at taking field notes as others. So, you know, leverage your team to make sure that you have really good field notes. And then the other thing is that, you know, when you come into the lab, if you've sampled something, and you don't get your next sample for another two months, you might be tempted to start extracting it and make the libraries, I'm so excited, I can't wait to do this, don't do it, right? Wait until everything is collected. So at least in your lab portion of it, you're controlling for which kit you're using, that you're not prepping all of your test things on the same day and your reference ones on the next, right? So that in the settings where you can randomize and control things, do that and and resist the temptation to start extracting RNA from one set before you have everything collected. Having things in the freezer at minus 80 is much better than having extracted with one kit part of your samples and then realizing, oh, I need to order a new kit and now all the lot numbers have changed. And so, you know, there are things in the field that you can't control and that's part of doing non-model genomics and it's super exciting and just record everything. And then for where you can control it, really think carefully about making sure that you don't start the next steps until you have everything together. All right, I will stop there. Thank you. Um, let's go to Sarah, then Martin, then Anna. Okay, so mine will come as no surprise to anyone who knows me, I'm obsessed with this, but like my big thing is that whenever possible, controlling for genetic background or just knowing. So like in corals, we're so lucky, we can like cut up a piece of, cut a colony of coral, right, and have the same genetic background in all of our treatments, for example, if we're just going to like, you know, do next century ocean conditions or whatever. Um, so that's really lucky. And I think the coral world is definitely kind of on board with doing this. But like, you know, in other organisms, you know, you maybe can't like, like in humans, you can't like cut a piece of an arm and then look how it responds or whatever. But like, you know, I think in that situation, like maximizing, like, maximizing your N um to because there's so much genetic variation in gene expression at least in corals it's our it's all it's almost always our primary unless we really stress the corals out our primary axis of variation is almost always genetic background um, we see clustering by um genotype and and it's funny because we can actually call clones without knowing they're clones yet just by their gene expression patterns because they cluster together I actually lost a six pack during my phd to my to my um, advisor because he bet me that they were clones. I was like, there's no way they're clones and then they were clones. Um, so, you know, genetic variation in gene expression is huge and any chance that you have to control for that is great. So like if you're studying frogs and you do like frog eggs, you know, do several broods of eggs and have those eggs under all of the conditions or whatever. Um, like any way you can control for that variation. And then if you, if you can't, then I would say like maximizing your N is always better. So if you're, let's say you have a set budget, I still think, if I had the choice between like three samples with like really good depth of coverage versus like 10 samples with pretty crappy depth of coverage, I would choose the 10 samples because maximizing N every time is gonna minimize some of this like variation that I like, that's always gonna confound um, your data sets. So that's just my, my little soapbox. I'll stop there. Um, yeah, basically uh, my, my point goes into the same direction like, like what Sarah just said um, that really I, I too often in the past, um, I got uh, some RNA-seq um, um, samples that um, needed to be analyzed. And um, the first thing I was looking at were replicates. And then people were not really thinking about, um, okay, actually, what, what do I want to get out of the, of the experiment? Is it differential gene expression? Or am I interested in a good de novo transcriptome assembly? So it seems maybe obvious for most people here, but maybe it isn't for, for all really think about what is your aim, what is your goal, and then um, is it differential gene expression, then really go for replicates, biological replicates, as uh, Sarah just said, 
I can uh, yeah, also fully recommend that. Um, is it a non-model organism? Do you need a transcriptome assembly? Then what is the, the read length? Do you need patent reads? So really the technical details about the sequencing um, to think carefully about that. Um, collect all of your samples as Joanna said, <laughs> and then, uh, then start and um, do your sequencing and then the analysis. Yeah. Um, well, in my case, it's just maybe some, some additional uh, recommendations from a bioinformatics perspective. Um, so, uh, Joanna said about some, some confounding effects that you can't control and, and, and that you probably don't even know that are present in your data. Um, well, I have to say that in some cases it's possible to detect those confounding elements that you don't know that are present in your data. I think it's great to record everything, so you should really do that and measure the temperature and everything that you can. Um, but for example, we, uh, we tried to address this problem and created a, a methodology that's basically will be analyzing on your data any kind of systematic variation that is not associated to your experimental design and with a method that is kind of based on, on uh, a multivariate approach, PCA-like um, uh, methodology. So um, you can use that to detect these unknown confounding effects and then you can remove that from your data for your RNA-seq data set and then continue with your differential expression analysis with uh, cleaner data. Um, so that's one thing that you can do. And another thing that, uh, that I will highly recommend, so in, in some cases you can't avoid the fact that you will be processing your samples and getting your data at different moments because uh, funding uh, issues or, you know, just because of because now you have done your experiment and then you do a follow-up experiment that you actually want to compare to something that you did before and then it's two different you know library preparation steps and um, so when this happens what I would recommend is that in your new experiment if you can you include some of the samples that you sequenced previously okay so that you include like Three samples. So, I mean, depending on the funding that you have, and you can allow uh, for it. But if you do that, then it's there is there is a, a by informatics a statistical opportunity for you to to estimate this batch effect of this uh, time event, you know, effect, and remove that from the data so that you can make data that is comparable. So these are like two tips uh, for in terms of experimental design. Awesome. Um, we'll go very quickly to Harold, and then I think we need to move on to the next question just for time purposes. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to make one quick point um, that, uh, you know, very often one has to integrate many different data sets <laughs> from, you know, different labs, all sorts of stuff like this. Um, and I have seen a number of papers where they try to sort of, you know, use some sort of batch correction thing or something like this. But if the experiments sort of stand on their own, um, I think one approach that is better, and I'm usually more likely to believe, is to treat it as a meta-analysis. So if you're doing the same sort of analysis on all the different data sets and you want to sort of integrate them all together because they're, you know, related tissues or something like this, treat them as different experiments and then go and use something that that's made to do a meta-analysis rather than going back and trying to, you know, do this, this really crazy thing of trying to figure out what the batch effects are that you don't really like could ever understand. It, it's, it's, it's much like less likely to give you um, uh, sort of sources of error and will usually give you stronger power. Um, yeah. Thank you, Harold. All right. Our next question is about de novo assembly. So for those of you who work with de novo transcriptomes, or for those of you who are interested in it, what are your strategies for evaluating the quality of de novo transcriptome assemblies? What metrics or visualization tools offer robust evaluations of the assembly in your opinion? Uh, 
Go ahead, Anna. Okay, so for evaluation, um, well, well now, nowadays I, I really tr try not to do assembly <laughs> using long reads, which requires also uh, data integration and analysis. So it's not that long reads will give you your transcripts without any, um, any effort. <laughs> Let's put it this way. You still have to do a lot of, uh, of work to get the, the right transcript models. Um, but I think that at least you have uh, probably better a resolution of, uh, of a different um, uh, alternative isoforms uh, of the same gene. For analysis, I normally, uh, well, what I have been doing for many years was to use the, the blast to go tool that we developed in, in my lab for that, because what we saw in general is that um, um, uh, the, the the great majority the the great majority of your uh, your transcript of your genes uh, you are expecting that they will have uh, some kind of functional role some kind of a, a relationship to to other genes that are uh, described in databases so um, last to go turned out to be a very good uh, um, tool to get insights of this and to detect. Um, uh, incomplete reconstructions because of, of this functional annotation and um, also to detect some kind of chimeric uh, uh, transcript models. Uh, so um, I, I like to, to run a, a, a blast to go analysis and to see how this looks like. Um, of course, uh, BUSCO analysis is great and uh, this is something that we also do and incorporate. Uh, it gives you a more uh, kind of quantitative value that you can compare to what other people have done. Um, uh, but usually what I will, you know, I would try to do is to uh, compare to other uh, organisms and, and, and then with that get an, uh, some kind of feeling of the um, uh, completeness of your transcript models and the completeness of your repertoire of um, of, of, of transcripts that you have detected in your sample. And replication, I think it's again, also very important for uh, transcript annotation, replication. I believe I saw Martin's hand go up and then we'll go to Joanna. Yeah, thanks. Actually, is it possible that I share my screen? Is this... I'll enable that right now. Just because I think this fits. Uh... I'm so happy that you brought something to share. Okay, you should be able to do so. Okay, let's see. Uh, I okay. Can you see this this now? I think so, right? Ah, cool. Yeah, and actually, I just thought about a study that um, yeah I conducted now something like two years ago, where we compared um, for different species. Um, transcriptome, the normal transcriptome assembly tools. And here you can see um, yeah, the different um, yeah, species that we selected, human, mice, um, Arabidopsis, a plant, a fungi, and, uh, and the bacteria. We performed basic pre-processing and then we run 10 different assembly tools. And then actually I stand uh, for the same question and uh, ask myself how now to evaluate uh, the quality of all these different um, yeah, the normal transcriptome assemblies. And um, Anna just yeah, already mentioned a couple of them, like like Busco that you might that you might know. And um, let me maybe just scroll here to. I mean, when you run all, all of these different tools here, um, I mean um, RNA cross where you get some basic statistics about the number of transcripts, the length of the transcripts, and something like that. Then you have this functional annotations like when you use Class to Go or Busco. And uh, you can map your reads again with some mapping tool and do some statistics. And in the end, um, you get something like, um, it has such a huge table <laughs> of different uh, values um, for all the different assembly tools. So the columns here are the assembly tools and the rows are the different uh, metrics um, that we um, tested here. And um, still it's super complicated because it depends really uh, heavily on your input data, right? On the species that you're looking at, um, is it single end, uh, paired end sequencing and so on and so on. 
And um, of course, there is, you can observe for some assembly tools that they perform maybe a bit better on certain data sets than on other. But in general, um, it's kind of a difficult question. And what we tried here is to, to normalize all of these scores and to calculate something like an um, yeah, average score for each tool, assembly tool, and um, here for each um, yeah, species again. The higher the score here, so the overall score over all these different metrics, and the better the assembly, so to say. And um, but yeah, as I said, I'm still a difficult question, and um, I agree with Anna that um, for myself, um, some metrics that rely on a functional annotation are always uh, nice because they give you a good idea of how actually how well are certain transcripts represented in your assembly, right? But Again, here, this might work better for model organisms where you have good reference databases. Non-model stuff, uh, it's again getting more complicated. And um, for me, um, it's always, it, it depends on the data set that you have in your hands. And it's always good to run a bunch of metrics and then try to um, get a feeling of your data and your assembly and then decide um, what you want to use. Joanne, I believe um, you're up next. Yeah, it's hard to follow that. That was incredible. I look forward to reading that. So I'll, I'll have a slight um, comment that I really look forward to. Martin, if, if that's published and if you could put the reference in the chat, that would be fantastic because I'd love to pull that up and that would make it really easy. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I would say is we spent a lot of time trying to wrap our heads around the best use of de novo of transcriptome assemblies and ultimately went with mapping to a distant, a quite distant um, assembled genome because it was easier to interpret and I'll, I'll really briefly explain what happened. So we had two different divergent populations and then the question became, do we do, we do a de novo transcriptome assembly of each one, and then somehow figure out what are the orthologs between them? Do we put them together and then create a de novo transcriptome of the merge, but then we're worried about having the same gene assemble separately because of variation between the two populations. You can see where this is going. It just became that, and there are not um, fantastic, tools for then, I mean, we could do, do a reciprocal blast or some kind of ortho finder to figure out what the orthologs are, but then in the context of then mapping reads and getting counts and how to compare the counts. So, so for us, if you, we found that if you do have a distantly, even distantly related genome that's assembled, then that's potentially easier to interpret the findings than doing a de novo transcriptome assembly. That's it. Thank you. All right, so our next topic is a fun one. Uh, it's differential expression and modeling expression. So we have two more questions in about 15 minutes before we go to our open question session at the end of the panel. Um, hopefully we can fit this all in. The first question, is about multi um, factorial study designs. So we are increasingly interested in gene expression under complex scenarios, for example, multiple stressor experiments, spatial gradients, temporal gradients. However, many popular tools for differential expression have a limited ability to handle multifactorial or mixed models. How do you incorporate complex experimental de designs into your models of expression or differential expression tests? And what are the strengths and pitfalls that should be considered? Sarah. So in our lab, you know, we, we very rarely are chasing after a, a specific gene. We're more interested in like patterns. So I feel like some of the pattern type analyses, so I'm thinking of like PCA, DAPC, um, like I'm thinking about plasticity of like a, well, for us, we can control for gen genetic background, right? So we can have like, individual A in like four different treatments across like five different time points. So we can ask questions about, you know, either log twofold change, like that magnitude or like distance moved in principal component space and ask questions about 
distance moved. So like as an estimate of like plasticity. Um, so that's one of the things we do um, in the lab is thinking it and that allows you to control for like um, lots of different confusing experimental designs. Often though, when we're analyzing data, we wish that we had more simple experimental designs. Like, oh, if I could go back in time, <laughs> I would like definitely do less PCO2 treatments and just do one. Um, uh, and I would have like maximized my N for treatment, right? Um, and then the other thing we've started doing a little bit is thinking about like effect sizes. So like log twofold change, so like relative to control, and then you have like a bunch of different treatments lined up or maybe a bunch of different time points. And you can look at like, um, like transcriptome resilience, like how far, how quickly does it come back? How quickly does it like recover? So we do a lot of stuff like that. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll maybe stop there because there's lots of hands up. So Anna's hand go up. Um, okay, so um, in my lab, we have uh, developed like two tools for more complex experimental designs. Uh, one is for time series analysis, and we use this a lot. Um, this is uh, basically a tool that will allow you to compare the profiles of gene expression uh, across time or any, I mean, could be time, but uh, we have been also using it for, for example, when you are uh, dealing with different uh, doses of a particular uh, treatment so that you have uh, uh, a part of your study, uh, your studies involving uh, uh, um, a continuous quantitative variable. So in these cases, we, we, we use this tool called MASIC Pro that basically will compare the profiles across time between different strains of, 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 of different treatments that you also evaluate across uh, time. And then we'll identify, you know, which, which, which are the genes that change their profile between the two or multiple conditions that you want to evaluate. So what we found is that it was a way in which uh, you could, we could leverage uh, the fact that you have a temporal profile and sometimes you don't have a very highly replicated data set because of that, because you already have to create, you know, different time points and then you cannot have a huge replication. So if you model the profile and this is uh, with a uh, polynomial regression approach, um, then you, you, you can describe these trajectories and then you can compare them. So this is what we do, what we did with the Masic Pro, and in other cases in which you don't have these uh, continuous uh, uh, elements, so more when you have uh, different, you know, conditions and then different strains and then different uh, treatments, so that really you have uh, uh, really a multifactorial design. We were using um, a method called uh, ASCA genes. And basically, this is a combination of uh, it's, it's, it's a combination of an ANOVA with a principal component analysis approach. And this is this is interesting because it will, on one hand, identify the patterns that are more abundant in your in your data set of the patterns of variation, but taking into account the experimental design that you have uh, implemented. So you don't have to make all the possible comparisons. You will extract these patterns and then you can focus on these differences where something is happening and then study this uh, in, in more details. Um, so these are two methods that were published uh, by, by us and we use it. We use them in, the, in, in these cases when you have this, when we have this kind of experiments. All right, thank you, everybody. Annie, I think we have some time to jump into functional analysis. Um, oh, we also have a second question about differential expression. I should ask that. Um, so going back to popular, sorry, going back to popular differential expression packages, um, what are the most critical differences um, between the statistical uh, sort of philosophies or assumptions of each package that users should be aware of and what might be some of the strengths or pitfalls of some of these more popular approaches, um, specifically for differential expression. Uh, 
I guess I could uh, start on that. I, so, you know, I'm kind of of the opinion that um, everyone is wrong and they're just different wrong, different kinds of wrong, right? So I think maybe sort of piggybacking off the, the, uh, the last question, right? Um, so I think one thing is that um, a lot of these RNA-seq tools were designed in a time when RNA-seq was relatively hard and relatively expensive and people weren't doing it as much as they are now. So like the, the case where you have like a two versus two and that's like a nature paper is kind of the era in which a lot of these things were designed. Um, and so what has happened in, in kind of I think is great is that a lot of experiments now are, are going to much larger sample sizes where these really strong assumptions about what the variance looks like and and you know what the, the distributional assumptions um uh, they don't really matter as much and so it's kind of better to use a tool if you have a lot of samples it's better to use a tool that that sort of is um is not doing as much to the variance as you kind of want the data to sort of dictate what the variance is going to look like, right? And so, um, you know, I'm not opposed to people if they have a data set that's large enough to actually just use a random effects model like vanilla, what is it called, like LME4 or something like this after doing proper normalization and so on and so forth and, 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 um, and transformation. Um, assuming you have the design and assuming you have enough data, data points um, within each, each block that you're... Uh, you're doing um, um, and so so going back to the the initial question about like what is what is uh, the strongest assumption to be honest like um, I think that if you have a data set that's small and you're kind of concerned about your science which I'm sure all of you are it's kind of best to just run a few of them and see what what they're going to give you it's it's definitely not, you know, statistically the best thing to do um, because you are doing a lot of this weird kind of like inference and stuff like this, but it's good to see what the tools are, are giving you in similarity. And the reason I say that is because they're all making very different, very strong assumptions about what the variance is going to look like, and that's going to, to bleed into your p-values a lot. And so the thing is that by default, the prior is wrong, um, and they're kind of making different priors, and it's it's okay to compare them, assuming that you're not going to just like pick the one that you think is going to tell your story better at the end of the day, right? And so the, the goal really is to kind of see where the similarities are and and kind of you know, go from there. Because I think relying on just one tool, especially if you have a data set that's relatively small and relatively small, I would say is like three versus three or two versus two or something like this, or even, you know, four versus four, um, you're, you're probably going to end up with a fair number of false positives because we know a lot of the tools are not calibrated well. Um, and it's just nature of the problem, right? Like you're doing literally thousands of tests with like four samples, like, come on, you know, you're going to get like some false positives. <laughs> Thanks, Harold. Um, and I saw Joanna's hand go up. And for those who may not be checking out the chat right now, we have a comment from Andrew Whitehead sharing a preprint by David Roke that offers some more discussion about what I believe Harold was just discussing. Um, so I actually have a question since it's a panel. I have a question for Harold because, you know, we're human. And so it's really hard not to see the result that confirms what we think about what's happening biologically and go with that. So how do you recommend, I mean, I actually have not taken the approach of comparing a bunch of tools. And so I'm kind of curious, you know, how do you take your human desire to explain biology in the most reasonable sense that one thinks it is? How do you reconcile that with this tool comparison? Because there is no tool for tool comparison. So, so how do you rec, how do you recommend someone like me who's like, oh, that one makes sense. Like biology makes sense. It, it confirms my hypothesis from, you know, the other tool that doesn't. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, yeah. So, so one thing that, that, um, I always get nervous here. I'll list the, the, the times when I get really nervous and the times when I think like things are sort of okay, right? So the times when I get really nervous is when I see that one tool spits out like three things that are differentially expressed and then another tool spits out like 2000. And then the thing that you think are, is interesting is that like number like 1998, right? Like that is that is when I get, get a little disturbed. Um, but, um, you know, 
I, I would say that one thing to keep in mind is that the FDR and p-values are very strange things to begin with, right? The FDR is telling you something not about that experiment, but about what it's like to do that experiment many times over and the expectation of having a false positive in many experiments, right? So it's important to keep this in mind. And I would say that, especially in this day and age when RNA-seq is relatively cheap, I kind of think of RNA-seq more as, as like a starting point to develop additional hypotheses for things that you can actually validate, right? So I think it's fair to, okay, like, I know this is, I'm, I'm like the devil right now, right? Because you guys are like, like, I tracked down this bear and like. <laughs> right, this is really, but yeah, this yeah. kind of touches yeah, on yeah. that. This is really yeah. hard in any non-model yeah, yeah. thing to validate, right? We don't have the ability yeah. to do CRISPR screens in a laboratory no, setting. No, I mean, granted, some of the, some people are developing amazing tools in non-models through the NSF NIH EDGE program. I sound like I'm making a plug for NSF, sorry. Um, but there are, interact you know there are things but yeah you're right i'm like oh you know yes that sounds amazing theoretically but for some non-models it's just not possible yeah. yet yet yeah yeah no i and and uh and i guess at the end of the day i don't really have a solid answer about like you know go do xyz um i don't think anyone has looked at this rigorously um to be honest um but it's certainly something that I do with, you know, collaborations and even more as like a sanity check, right? Like, I think it's fair if you feel very comfortable, you know, running DEC and you know that in the past it's given you like really strange uh, things in some circumstances, but is right, like, you know, in this, this circumstance, go run like Lima or something like this as a sanity check. And if like Lima says, like, there's no way in hell this thing is differentially expressed, well, then maybe think really carefully about whether or not you want to make that the star of your paper. I guess that's kind of my, my, uh, my takeaway. Not so much that like you're going to go and do this analysis and it's going to be some super rigorous thing, but like uh, sort of as like a sniff test as, or a sanity check. Totally. I mean, I agree with that. And I often am telling students like, just look at the raw data. Do any, I mean, you find these interesting, look at the raw data. I want you to plot the genes, plot that like you should know the raw data so intimately and and check anything like that we're like well does the raw data even have a suggestion of this or or normalized raw data right okay i'll stop i think i saw sarah's hand and then anna's hand yes yeah, so i'm just going to quickly build off of what harold said because it's like resonates so well with me like the i mean i think there's just like a chance of getting a mistake right and especially when you're making lots of samplings there's lots of chances for mistake and even if you're fdring it's just like um, you know, feels a little dirty or something. So I think that like, you know, we, we generally take the, like start large, right? PCA is like I said, like all the like general, what is your, what like, I feel like that's like kind of like the feeler test. Like what's the main thing happening here, right? And then you can go in and maybe do some like go enrichments and maybe look at go categories and read tea leaves or whatever. And then and then within those go categories, like look for genes. And if there's like, you know, lots of patterns and gene pathways that like make sense, then I think you've kind of like let the data speak. But I think that's like my big thing in the lab is like, let's not go in a, let's not like, let's not try to find a specific fish. Let's let like the ocean's worth of genes tell us what the waves are doing today or whatever. Like, so I think it's like start big and then like kind of narrow in. And, and then hopefully like Joanna said, like, I mean, total bonus right if it makes biological sense but like yeah I mean I think p-values are grain of salt right like um Hanny has a paper she's writing up right now actually where there's like really interesting patterns like consistent patterns in a specific set of genes that are enriched when you look at it this way that I just described and everyone in the lab's like mm, but the p-value and I'm like mm, p-value so I feel like it's kind of like this game that we play but it's like why do we play this what is p05 why not p06 like I just think it's like Whereas if you found this pattern in a very like a prior way, I think that's fine. So I, I kind of, I think that I agree with the three of you, although it seems like you are talking differently. Uh, you have different opinions, but I, I don't think you have. Actually, I think that yeah, I also get nervous when two methods give very different re results, but some, sometimes they, they don't. And um, 
maybe you want to go back to the to the data and say, well, maybe this one is not giving me a, a p value, a significant p value, but it's close. So at the end of the day, is you know, it's not that different the result if you take the time to look at the data uh, more 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 carefully. And I also think that we have to to the to to not believe so hard on you know the absolute the the, the p value. I mean the, this. P values and statistics are tools to, to bring you closer to the biology that you want to study. At the end of the day, you have to look at your data. Maybe you have to see, to, to, uh, to put them on pathways, see how they behave, the significant ones, but also the not significant ones because maybe they are kind of there. So at the end, you get a kind of impression of what could be going on. And then, yeah, if you can, you can tested, not maybe with the CRISPR, say, but with something else. And I yes, I know that um, uh, rna stick is cheap, but getting samples in non-model organisms is not cheap. And, and that is where now your limitation is. Uh, you cannot generate, I mean, I am involved in a project with, uh, with, with manatees. I mean, you cannot get, you know, thousands of samples of a manatee. It's, it's just not possible. So the limitation is there. But you, if you try to put them in the context of the biology, you have, you can compare different samples and you see these trends that Sarah were, was talking about. I think it's when you start getting to, Creo que no te to, to the reality, sorry. <laughs> that was my Siri talking to me. Thank you, Anna. All right, so we promised everybody that we'd have some time for open questions. So Hanny and I are, I think, going to pull some questions from the thriving chat discussion that hopefully we have done a decent job navigating. Um, Hanny, is there anything you want to start with? Uh, so I pulled a couple of questions uh, from the earlier chat. It seems there was some interest in calling SNPs from RNA-seq data. Um, one question that I believe uh, Kitty Lauderhose posted was uh, whether when calling SNPs from transcriptomic data, is there any concern for allele-specific expression and how that might um, influence uh, SNP pattern? So I'll just... So yes, I think there's huge benefit to calling SNPs um, in RNA-seq, but I think there's like, I don't think we know, and maybe, and maybe other people on the call do know more about it, but I think we don't like know enough about it yet to know what it's doing. Like if you're, so like, I think it's perfect if you're interested in like calling clones, like we do that in corals all the time. Like we do RNA-seq, see some weird things and we can like call clones that we like accidentally sample twice or that like, I don't know, they're just doing weird reproduction in the field or whatever, we're able to call those out of the data. And so you're able to model that genetic background in your in your RNA seq data. But you know, cryptic species is also just like a big signal in the data. So that's I think an easy call. But if you're get going down the hole of like, can we do population genetic questions? Can we call SNPs in RNA seq and ask questions about population genetic structure? I don't know. And Andrew and Andrew and I have been chatting and other people chiming in there on the chat as well. Like, I don't know, but I will say that like, I, I don't think he is here today, but I wish Misha Matz was here because I know that he's got a data set where they sampled the exact same corals with tag seek, RNA seek, so like really short 50 base pair reads and rad seek, and they get very different answers about population genetics. So I like, and that's corals. That's one reef track, that's one species does this hold is it a weirdo data set like i don't know but i i do think that like it's worthy of investigating and i don't have an answer for your second question from katie because i don't deal a lot with that but maybe i think harold's okay yeah i sorry i i lost track of the question um and by by no fault of anyone um only me, but the <laughs> it was about a little specific about, expression. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and whether that could influence, you know, if you're calling it from RNA seq data, then you know that might give you, you know, false heterozygotes or homozygotes or what have you. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, so. So I, I'm not super familiar in non models, and you know, people care about this a lot in human genetics and stuff. Um, there's some pretty decent tools for doing this. Um, 
that take into consideration lots of things like phasing and all sorts of stuff like this? Um, I think, honestly, it's a really hard question. I guess it depends on how much recombination you expect and all sorts of complicated things like this, which I'm, I'm, I don't know crap about non-models, to be honest. So like, uh, I could tell you lots about LD in humans, but nothing about <laughs> LD in uh, coral reefs. <laughs> but, uh, but um, you know, my impression is that if you're interested in calling allele specific expression, and um, it's actually relatively robust um, compared to doing like um, population genetics without allele specific expression, if that makes sense. Um, however, you know, if you're talking small sample sizes, I'd be very weary. Um, it's uh, it's a hard question to do, you know, genome wide. Um, and you know the, the sample sizes we're talking about in humans are like on the order of hundreds, sometimes thousands. Um, and you know, I, I don't know that uh, um, that they. I guess I don't know what what people have developed without making you know very finely tuned things about like VCFs and all sorts of things like this. Um, which you know, if you guys are having trouble munging a GFF because uh, you know, <laughs> some tool is like requiring it. I don't know that you want to like go in down the, the, the rabbit hole of ECFs. Um, <laughs> Joanna, go ahead. So I'll answer that from a slightly different perspective is that in calling, so we've called SNPs a lot from RNA-seq data for population genetics, for um, inferring demography from the fourfold synonymous sites that are in coding regions from, called from RNA-seq data. We have not been concerned about allele-specific expression, um, partially because many of the things that we're doing are global analyses. And so I'm not concerned that allele-specific expression in a few genes is going to drive the patterns, right? We've been able, for example, in a recent study, we just have RNA-seq data. We were getting some weird um, outliers in our PCA. And so I said, you know, can you just, let's just call SNPs from those and see if they were actually hybrids or mislabeled, right? And we call SNPs and we see very, very clearly that the individuals are actually based on genotype from the wrong population. So it seems to be a, a mislabeling issue or sample swap. It wasn't a swap, but some kind of mislabeling, right? Or fish jumped into the wrong tank, uh, yikes. But that is the kind of the level at what, which we're using the RNA-seq data. And, and for that, allele-specific expression has, has no bearing on that, right? It's, it's washed and so Now, if you're interested in whether or not there's a mutation in a specific gene of interest that may be functional for a specific reason, then I would be more nervous about calling SNPs to say something about a specific mutation in a specific gene. And then in that case, I would, I would be concerned and I would say, you need to validate that in DNA data and other in other ways. Um, but for the population genetic parameters or for looking at these, you know, large scale genetic, um, parameters. I'm not concerned about it. Yeah, I'll just say that when I read Katie Lauderhouse's question, um, it really resonated with me because I work on a system where there is some grounds for correlations between regulatory mutations that affect expression and gene coding region mutations. And so if you're looking at the relatedness of populations based on SNPs and coding regions, you might have an overrepresentation of certain alleles from like crosses, for example, or um, a given population. Um, all right, I would also like, since we have some extra time to encourage anybody in the audience to um, feel free to like raise their hand or um, post any other questions in the chat. Um, and if we don't see any, um, we can move on to one last sort of topic that we tabled to cover if we have some extra time. All right, Hanny, I'm not seeing any hands. Um, so I guess we can move on to functional analysis. All right, um, so I think, you know, obviously a lot of times we do RNA-seq to try and get uh, some indication of what's happening, what like functions these genes might be 
doing in our organisms that are being differentially regulated. Um, and obviously, especially in non-model organisms, the ability to infer that function is uh, pretty limited. And so we might rely on tools like Go Enrichment or COG or KEG that look at, you know, kind of higher level functions. Um, but what are other, uh, first, how can we make the most of these somewhat imperfect uh, techniques? And what can we do to integrate or go beyond some of these common approaches to extract meaningful uh, functional information from our uh, differential expression uh, kind of analyses? I feel like I've talked too much, so I feel like someone else should say something. Um, maybe maybe I, I start. So I think this is uh, it's really 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 good question and really not easy to answer. And uh, yeah, I think there is no no real uh, solution to that. But what I just often think about is um, integrating other data sources. So for example, um, proteomics or something like that. So I mean, we often focus. We have our RNA seq data. That's nice. We do transcriptomics. Um, but often I think, and I mean. We know that um, research is also going more into the direction of omics and integrating data from different sources. And when you, for example, can do transcriptomics, but also some proteomics, and then get a better idea of your functional annotation. Because, I mean, there's also, I think, a discussion about actually what of your transcripts are then translated, right, and are actually functional in the end. And for me, this is a major challenge right now to. Um, have also tools and um, um, pipelines that uh, integrate data from different sources. But I think if we can do that and uh, manage that, we have a good chance to really improve this whole functional annotation um, of, um, of our transcripts. Yeah. Can I just need to chime in one thing. <laughs> The other thing I think is really powerful when you've coupled your RNA seq with other phenotypes is to do some sort of like we in our lab we use WGCNA like weighted gene co-expression network analysis and then using the instead of just saying like you know you know talking about it in your discussion like oh we measured all this physiology and then we did RNA seq and we found that these genes were differentially expressed and then oh that like oh look we also see that like in this treatment we saw an enrichment of this set of genes and then this you know we saw that like protein was less or something. You know, if you put it into a WGCNA framework, it treats those traits as continuous trait data and can correlate those trait data with modules of genes and how they express. And you can do that in a in a signed manner, so you can say whether genes are enriched or like upregulated or downregulated. And we use that a lot to kind of like bring it back to phenotype um, in a way other than just other than just like discussing, which is also fine. But if you're looking for kind of like a, a way to kind of link them a little bit better, I think WGCNA does a really great job. Um, and then we use a lot of like go enrichment rankings to compare data sets too. So like, I think there's lots of like cool fun ways with these kind of like big data to kind of like dream up fun ways to like make relationships between data sets that are like have all the other like caveats, right? Taken at different times, different species, blah, 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 all these things. but um i think kind of like taking it that next step and like linking things a bit more is like what i'd like to see like what i'm kind of pushing my lab to do more or they're pushing me to do whatever is the, probably their idea um but what i'd like to see the community shift to more as well thanks sarah i see anna's hand up and then we also had one question in the chat that we'll get to after from angela puentes pardo before we end today well, I, I think that the question is very difficult because you say, what can you do beyond a, a go and a care of a pathway analysis with no model organisms? <laughs> and I was trying to think, so what, what else can be done? It's kind of, 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 of hard to do something else. I honestly, I don't know if putting, I mean, for if you are talking about functional annotation of, of genes, I don't, I don't think that you can do much with with all with, with other data sets for I mean with proteomics maybe you can have some kind of insight that the gene is being expressed but 
but but actually you don't add very much on the function of that one gene and with proteomics you always have the the, the issue that uh, the coverage of, of of the target space is much more limited and then you are going to be having a risk I mean you will find those proteins that are more abundant uh, and probably already know what they are so I think that's that's complicated. Um, I really think that the way to go is is is, is try to uh, to map your data into the model species for which you have already some insights, and then try to combine this with uh, maybe some information that will be able in the literature. There is now some tools that are able to extract also functional insights from uh, from literature mining and then uh, combine this with the uh, already existing annotations. So that gives you uh, the possibility to, to go beyond the existing databases and provide additional insights on, on, on function. Um, but beyond that, if you don't want to go into experimentation, that is what you will need to do finally to test some of your hypothesis on function. I don't really have like a magic solutions. But I think retrieving uh, uh, data with text mining tools is also a possibility that has not been uh, explored too much yet from non-model organisms. And this is also a valuable resource uh, to explore. Thank you. Um, yeah, we kind of saved that one for last because it was a, a little bit of a, of a tough one, especially for, for non-model organisms. Um, so then one last question uh, from the chat. Um, I heard that alignment independent quantification, such as with salmon, should be preferred over feature counts. What is your opinion about this? I guess as an author of a pseudo alignment technique, I should probably say something. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Someone was just knocking on my door. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, one of the things is that when you have alternative splicing, um, it's you're like any sort of imbalance in alternative splicing is going to directly lead to really strange things in quantification RNA seq, um, even if all you care about is at the gene level. So, they're using something that uses expectation maximization. You know, it could be Arsim, it could be uh, Callisto, it could be Salmon. Any of these tools are going to give you a less biased answer, um, assuming you have a reference that is somewhat in, uh, somewhat complete. Um, I think this this question has not been really thoroughly um, understood because there are like real world trade offs, right? Like. Um, you know, you're making a really strong assumption that you have a complete annotation when you're doing some sort of pseudo alignment or, um, or uh, even, even um, isoform style mapping, um, that, that this annotation is very complete. Um, and there is a real world trade off about kind of doing something that's just like saying, okay, this is a re relatively rough region versus this is a complete annotation. And now I'm going to do an expectation maximization, assuming that this thing is, is complete. Um, from the examples that I've seen, again, mostly model organisms, the the annotations are sort of good enough such that you can kind of be okay with having a, a sort of wrong annotation. Um, I don't know how far off this is going to be um, in some of the systems that you folks are looking at. Um, that being said, um, myself and a number of other uh, um, uh, methods developers have developed tools that, that take into consideration this, this uncertainty from this mapping process, which you can do very easily with pseudo alignment, but you can't really do with, um, with full blown alignments and, and, um, and feature counts and this sort of stuff. So I will say that um, it kind of depends. <laughs> um, you're often probably going to get a very similar answer. And then there are going to be cases where you get very different answers. Um, and it's going to depend strongly on what the annotation looks like. Um, yeah. Anna, go ahead. Um, so I don't really have a, 
an opinion about alignment independent or not of a feature counts, but something that Harold said, I think is very important. I think it's very relevant for, especially for non models and is that you assume that you have a complete uh, transcriptome annotation. And I think that for non model organisms, the actual transcriptome, especially if you, I mean, if you don't have a good reference and, and you are, you are trying to use the short reads to assemble to identify your transcripts and then evaluate them. I think, I, th I think this is a very hard and very unsolved uh, uh, problem. What I would really, really suggest to everyone is to start using long reads to define your transcriptomes. And then you can use the short reads for quantification with whatever the salmon of a feature count method. Um, because that's gonna give you much better quality transcript models, but also the ones that are really expressed in your samples and it will complement whatever is missing in your reference. And what we have seen is that this is a much better uh, um, template to quantify against. So one thing that we, we do now is, <clears throat> Uh, I mean, long reads are expensive, uh, but you, you can make a pool with your different samples and different tissues, the different things that you want to evaluate and then get a long reads uh, sequencing of that and then use uh, the uh, uh, short read data that is taken in independent samples to map against that and then uh, do your differential expression analysis in this way. So I think that's what I would recommend. So I want to actually I want to share my screen and I'll I'll really briefly walk people through this and and the reason that I that I want to bring this up this is unpublished data um is depending on what kind of RNA sequencing you're doing we haven't talked about library prep at all but you could be doing a poly A library prep you could be doing a ribo minus and then what your transcriptome, your reference looks like is gonna differ. And what kind of inferences you're gonna make are gonna differ. And this is gonna differ based on the tissue that you're looking at. So let me share my screen. So I've been looking at these data a lot recently. I'm super excited to share them. Um, let me just, all right. And let me just walk you through this. So this is actually from um, hibernating bears and active season bears. And we used HiSat to, to map ribo minus RNA seq data to either now we have four different things here that we're mapping to so three of them the first three colors the blue the orange and the green in each one are either a long read transcriptome from iso seq data uh, the reference transcriptome or a merge transcriptome that uses both the long read data from the pack bio and the reference transcriptome. And then we just map to the reference genome. Okay. And so there's that in the gray. And what I want to point out is that depending on what tissue you're looking at and depending on what season you're looking at, the percent of reads that map to each of those transcriptomes that are from these are coding regions. Now, actually, some of them have non-code, but we'll just assume they're just coding regions versus the reference genome, which has all of the non-coding regions, all of the unannotated regions, all of that are different. And so I just put this up just to, you know, um, at the very end, over time, put in your mind that, that this is this is pretty, this is just complicated and it depends on tissue type and on season, all of these different factors. And um, I'm just happy to share these data with other people to get your mind going, oh my gosh, right? Like all of these tissues are different and we have ribo minus versus poly A. And, and so also just thinking about, you know, what kind of library prep are you doing matters? And what are you, what are you thinking about just all of those early steps that we didn't really talk about? There you go. That simultaneously amazed me and kind of terrified me. <laughs> me too, when I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much to unpack here. Well, um, I wanna just thank all of our panelists for joining us and having a really amazing uh, and lively discussion. I certainly learned a lot, uh, both uh, exciting and terrifying and <laughs> worrisome uh, points. Um, so hopefully everyone 
enjoyed it as well. This uh, whole session has been recorded and will be uh, put up on the Marine Working Group uh, website uh, probably in a few days. Uh, yeah, Sam, do you want to add anything else? No, that's all I would say. Yeah, I want to thank Sarah, Martin, Joanna, Harold, and Anna again, and all of the um, audience members who are here today, and those of you that I've seen in the participation column at every panel. Thank you for attending. Um, yeah, this will be recorded and posted soon. Um, and to the panelists, you may also get some follow up questions from us about various resources, be they your own, uh, you know, packages or papers. Um, and yeah, we'll, uh, you'll probably hear from us soon. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend and happy Juneteenth to everyone. Thank happy you. Happy Juneteenth, everybody. Thank Thanks all. Bye.